Thank you very much, Carol. That's a fascinating overview of the contribution that, that HLF has made. And uh, um, if I could just say, although she's announced that she's leaving not till next April, I'm pleased to say, I would like to just say a personal thank you, because I think it's probably the biggest audience I'm going to get a chance to say it in front of before she goes, to Carol for the huge support that she has personally given our organisation and so many others in the heritage sector in her time at HLF. So now a, a move away to a broader agenda than the heritage world. I'm really delighted to invite Tom Walker to come and talk to us about the Northern Powerhouse. Um, just while I set up, so put your hand up if you've ever won the lottery. That's a much more interesting <laughs> Exactly, These, down the front. Uh, So I've got no slides, I'm afraid, and I thought I would leave that to the, uh, the funders, the architects, uh, and everyone else that you're going to hear from. But I'll give you a little talk on the Northern Powerhouse. And although introduced as a sort of broad topic, actually, I think the relevance, uh, well, I hope I give you a sense of why it is so uh, relevant. But just, to, just to explain my job, so I'm the Director of Cities and Local Growth, which means I look after enterprise zones, local enterprise partnerships, the £12 billion uh, local growth fund, HS2 regeneration, a whole sort of suite of what used to be called uh, regeneration. But I think, as in the earlier talks, it's really about stimulating economic growth. Uh, so I'm really delighted to be here on behalf of the government, but I also have a, a sort of personal passion uh, for this agenda. I've worked on housing market renewal, enterprise zones, neighbourhood planning, community rights, which I think that combination of things comes together. But 10 years ago, I also spent, uh, I went to Germany for the World Cup and I stayed in a town called Duisburg that many of you will never ever have heard of. Uh, and in between three World Cup games, uh, spent 10 days touring around the industrial heritage of the Ruhr Valley. And if you ever get a chance, you'll hear about it later, but if you ever get a chance to go to some of these places, they are truly breathtaking the Zolverein steelworks is just something else and next year I get to go once every 10 years um, I've got two very small children but next year I'm going to Marseille for the uh, the French European tournament so Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation <coughs> awaits me so what am I going to cover in this talk two things I mean talk about the Northern Powerhouse and it's interesting whenever I come to Manchester I ask people what it means whether they're people in the city council who give a pitch perfect account or just friends of mine who live here who sense that something is happening but I'll give you the the government version and I'll try and link it uh, to the agenda for this this conference um, so what is the northern powerhouse uh, I think it was clear it's good that I'm doing this uh, immediately after the spending review but last week uh, the government reiterated again its long-term economic plan which at the heart I think is a sincere belief because the Chancellor is leading it and the key thing about government is if you've got the Chancellor things will happen but if you don't have the Chancellor it won't happen so the Chancellor launched it here 18 months ago uh, but a true commitment to rebalancing the nation's economy I think everyone knows the northern economy if you take it as a whole has underperformed compared to the UK and actually you translate that into cities underperforming uh, to only one of the eight core cities in England performs above national economic trend. So that is the sort of under, underpinning economic rationale. And there are all sorts of figures that get quoted, but if the northern uh, economy could grow at the same rate, that same forecast rate of the rest of the UK, by the end of the next decade, that would add £37 billion to the UK economy. So these are sort of serious economic uh, economic potential that we're talking about. And the Northern Powerhouse, and we've had an interesting journey in the last five years. I've worked jointly in Biz, the business department, and DCLG now, but DCLG is my home department. Regionalism was not talked about. It was, uh, it was abolished. Um, but now with the Northern Powerhouse, we have LEPs, and I think the LEP experiment, the Local Enterprise Experiment, uh, Partnership Experiment, has been successful. But the Northern Powerhouse... And later this week, you'll hear ministers talking about the Midlands engine or about something bigger 
uh, and about an aggregation of activity and putting it in the hands of uh, leaders in the north, whether civic leaders or business leaders. And there are all sorts of international uh, comparisons, but the, the competition here is not between Leeds and Manchester. It's between this country, its regional economies, and London, if you see it that way, but I think more importantly, the economies of Europe, Tokyo, and New York. That is the thing about scale, and it's very easy in an environment like this, which is about individual projects, to lose that sort of sight of the game and the fight that we have I think, as a country, to sort of secure economic destiny. I'll say something about the, this is a sort of depressing bit of the, the speech, but the, the, the shortcomings of the, the economic challenge here, that imbalance we know goes back 30, 40, possibly many more years, uh, and performance has been weaker than London uh, and the southeast. Uh, we know the deep-rooted structural reasons for that, um, but just again by illustration of some figures, the unemployment rate in the northeast, 8.6%, so it's over double what we see in London and the southeast. So these are sizable uh, economic gaps. We see the out migration of younger people uh, to London uh, and the rest of the southeast. And we know that while the north has got some of the very best universities and attracts some of the very best students, retaining them is hard. So the Northern Powerhouse is about addressing those sorts of challenges. But on the strengths, uh, the strengths of the North, the economy is growing overall. Uh, I think everyone recognises that it is, um, of course, varied in different parts of the country. Um, and the Northern economy is worth £290 billion. Uh, and although I've said that no cities other than Bristol are growing ahead of trend, the northern cities are growing faster than other comparable parts of the UK. The north created 100,000 jobs in the last year, and the north is home to more than half a million businesses, as I've already said, many of the world's finest universities uh, and leading research institutions. I've mentioned scale already, so we're talking about 15 million people, and the figures say that a job in the north is being created every five minutes. Previous speaker, Carol, said 50 mile radius. My notes say 40 mile radius. Uh, so no doubt that I'm excluding some uh, people here who will feel dismayed. So we'll go with the 50. But you have Leeds, Sheffield, Liverpool and Cheshire. And of course, you have the important uh, economy in the northeast. Other facts and figures in Nissan, uh, Nissan continue to invest in Sunderland and I think people are familiar with this statistic but more cars are made there than in the whole of Italy and the county of Yorkshire created more jobs than France last year so you can take a doom and gloom scenario but I think you have to face up to the structural changes uh, that the nor or structural challenges that the northern economy faces but you can provide a whole set of statistics which show the power the industry uh, and the progress that is going on uh, in the northern economy. So the northern powerhouse is a lot about connectivity uh, and a lot about capturing more of those benefits and addressing some of those challenges. Yesterday, the government made more announcements on HS2 and transport for the north, the transport for the north, the body that will integrate transport planning uh, across the north, announced the new chairman of Transport for the North, John Cridland, the former Director General of the CBI, sort of no better person really to lead an agenda about driving growth and regeneration with someone who understands the needs of business and what actually unpicks economic growth. Transport for the North is doing an economic review. It's the first piece of sort of substantive strategy work I think that we'll see on this drive which will report in the new year. And if you're, depends which organisation, of course, you're representing today, but do partake in that review and use it to make the case for the sort of argument that you're running here, which is the role of industrial heritage uh, and the legacy of the northern economy. And that plan, I think, will shape the unfolding work of the government and the northern powerhouse. 
There are already extensive transport plans, uh, again, some mentioned in yesterday's announcement, faster Transpennine connection, integrated smart ticking, ticketing and uh, an Oyster equivalent across the north. Electrification of part uh, of the Transpennine Railway will uh, provide six fast, train, uh, fast trains per hour between Manchester, Leeds, York, and take 15 minutes off the journey time. And we saw yesterday, as I said, the announcement of the extension of the HS2 route to Crewe, bringing forward the, the completion of that part of the route by six years. So these are sizable investments addressing some of those strategic challenges. And Jim O'Neill, who's the minister uh, leading a lot of the Northern Powerhouse work, we have several ministers for the Northern Powerhouse in government, but Jim O'Neill will say transport is a precondition for unlocking economic growth, but alone it's not sufficient. So then we have devolution. You've already heard uh, about devolution, and I hope if you're from the north and attending the conference today that it starts to ring some bells and mean something to you beyond government announcements. But the, the fundamental principle here is giving leaders, civic leaders and business leaders across the country, it's not exclusive to the northern cities, powers and control over their own economic destiny. The first devolution deal and the first directly electric metro mayor agreed was here in Manchester. The Chancellor gave speeches in this, I'm not sure if it was in this bit of the building, but in the main hall, uh, setting out that vision. And I think when the government was returned in May, we thought, well, over the period of a parliament, we might get half a dozen more places signing up for the sort of devolution deal we did with Manchester and committing to directly elected mayors. But already we have Sheffield, Tees Valley, the North East and Merseyside and slightly further south, the West Midlands. So this is about two, uh, what, no two places um, being the same and built on a, a, an experiment five years ago that Greg Clark launched, which was the original city deals to say, you tell us in central government what will unlock economic growth in your areas. And from that has flown a whole agenda of devolution and commitment to projects and then beyond projects to structural reform, which I think is a great ally to your work uh, and your passion in this room. Now we know that times are more austere, but what we're trying to do is free up the leadership and free up the control of resources to allow that uh, economic goal and the sort of uh, passion for place and identity to be developed together. So I said of transport that Jim O'Neill would say uh, uh, that it's a precondition but not sufficient. He says exactly the same uh, about devolution. And the reason for mentioning Jim a couple of times, his landmark report 18 months ago when he was, before he joined government, uh, made the case for city-led growth. It built on that work that we'd already started with city deals. And at its heart, uh, at the heart of the argument is the case that cities uh, into the 21st century and beyond are where economic growth will be realized. Not just because of the underperformance I talked about at the start of this uh, discussion, but actually because of the potential created by the sort of economy that this country needs to become. And the reason cities uh, are important is because if you start to take the city agenda with the sort of slideshow we've seen from all the previous speakers, it's not exclusively a city agenda, but realizing unlocking the potential of the industrial heritage, I think is principally a city agenda. So this is how these two agendas start to come together. There are three things that I thought I should mention about cities uh, in particular. The first is the agglomeration effects. You know, there needs to be a, an economic rationale um, for what we're doing, and I think what you're doing, and previous speakers already alluded to this. But agglomeration effects of cities, the access to markets, network of business, knowledge spillovers, all the ingredients that are essential for the creative industries, the digital economy that we're trying to create. The second is human capital. 
over the last century, we know that productivity growth, that driving agenda for this government, increasing productivity, has gone hand in hand with rising human capital. More people become educated to a higher level, seeking work in uh, the sorts of industries I've already talked about. It's at the heart of our devolution agenda, why we're devolving the control of skills budgets, along with many other funding streams, but unlocking the potential of human capital. And if you take it to the north, retaining graduates, not just seeing them move to London. And then making cities attractive. I mean, others have already said uh, the transformation of this city from 25 years ago. I moved to London in 1994. In 1994, the population of London was still declining. And I've seen, I've lived always in the East End and the, the sort of northeast quadrant of London, seen that transformation. And I think that can easily be realised outside of London. And although it's not government policy, I think very interesting questions about where young people do go in the face of a, an affordability crisis in London. So a huge sort of opportunity. And then I thought I might just bridge into... Uh, our work on city deals, enterprise zones, and Devo deals to talk about uh, some particular projects. I'll do this very briefly, but I want to sort of prove the point that there isn't some economic agenda over here and a sort of passion for local place over here that never meets. So just to name check some particular projects that we, we are sponsoring. The Creative Quarter in Nottingham's lace market area, unlocked by funding through the city deal, um, the set squared engine shed in Bristol, again at the very heart of the local enterprise partnership sort of digital economy where they hold their, their meetings. It's in Brunel's original station from 1841. And the point that others have made about the industrial heritage being inspiring, I've been to meetings in Brunel's boardroom and you sit round that table and it is impossible, whatever you're discussing, but it is impossible I think to leave that sort of environment uninspired and to challenge your own work about what you can achieve, whether it's government work, whether it's community project. So the inspirational nature uh, of community buildings is, is very powerful. In Glasgow, we funded the Tontine building in the Merchant City. In our enterprise zones in London, we're doing up the, uh, not we, but we are funding and sponsoring the, the, the conversion of the Millennium Mills. Uh, last week, we announced a new wave of enterprise zones right across the country, 26 new enterprise zones, including Stoke, uh, their project for developing a ceramic valley, high-tech digital ceramics, again, building on the very best industrial legacy. We have enterprise zones at the Boots Factory, grade one listed, in Nottingham, and through the city deal, we've unlocked the Plymouth Docks uh, Maritime Quarter. Really transformative schemes, some of which have sat behind closed doors, the Plymouth one in particular, for 30 years, waiting for the MOD uh, and the council to unlock it. And the city deal methodology, the sort of places coming to us and saying, this is what we want to achieve, and government shifting on that is really at the heart of our growth agenda. So to wrap up, really, what I want to say is the Northern Powerhouse, I think, really is a serious commitment from this government. And don't underestimate the significance of the Chancellor's backing for this agenda. It's not just a transport agenda, and it, this is too short a time to fully unpack devolution, but it's really putting the tools of economic growth in the hands of local leadership. And that it's really important that that economic growth agenda isn't seen as separate from the sort of drive, passion, enthusiasm you have for your projects here, because I think the way that government is working with places is underpinned by devolution and a commitment to the neighbourhood level, which is just as relevant for many of your projects, is genuine. And the trick is, in a climate of more limited resources, to use that passion locally, that leadership nationally, to try and achieve more of the brilliant slides that we've already seen. So I hope that gives you an overview of what we're doing from government. And I'm very happy for any, anyone in the audience to contact me to follow this up in more detail. So thank you very much.
Tom, thank you very much indeed. Actually, I can't think of a speech that would better represent the, the title of this conference, which is Industrial Heritage and Engine for Productivity. I think you know, what Tom has just told us about the Northern Powerhouse aligns perfectly with, with the concept behind this conference and what all of us believe, which is that uh, the industrial heritage that we have is a huge opportunity to create something for the 21st century while saving what's really important about the past. Okay, it, it's uh, time for coffee. I'm sure you are all more than ready for coffee. Uh, we're back at 11.45. We will start chasing you back at 11.40 because there's quite a lot of people to get into the room. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, could everyone take their seats? Welcome back, everybody. Could you all take your seats as soon as possible, please? <laughs> I shall be naming names in a moment. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed your coffee break and everybody managed to get some very unhealthy uh, cakes or similar while you were out there. Um, what I'd like to do move now is to sort of move on to our session this afternoon. Uh, sorry for the rest of the morning. I'm getting really ahead of myself here. Um, what I want to do first is to introduce David Caulfield, who's Director of Regeneration and Development Services from Sheffield City Council. David, thank you very much. Well, first of all, it's really good to be here today. Um, I think we've had some excellent presentations this morning. Um, like, like other presenters, I've tried to keep to lots of images rather than lots of text, but let's see how it goes as well. Um, I think it is an exciting time to be working in development and regeneration in the north. We hear much about the northern powerhouse, and there's a palpable sense of excitement about the future for great cities such as Sheffield, Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds. Our northern cities are fiercely proud places and that is inextricably bound up in their commercial and industrial histories. But we also need to understand the often negative outside perceptions of the former northern industrial cities and how our industrial landscapes fueled these perceptions. Many northern cities have actively tried to broaden their economies away from traditional industries towards financial and professional services, IT, and new forms of advanced manufacturing. But does that mean our industrial heritage is obsolete in these post-industrial cities? And given the often negative outside perceptions of our northern industrial cities, would it be better to distance ourselves from our industrial past in how we position and market our cities going forward? The answer is an emphatic no. Our, industri our industrial heritage is more important than ever. And my presentation will illustrate why this industrial heritage is a critical element of the attractiveness of our cities going forward. I'll illustrate with a few examples from Sheffield and how it's used its industrial heritage to forge a, new forge a new identity for the city going forward and a place where people, the emphasis on people, choose to live, work and play. So Sheffield Steel City, it's internationally renowned as a steel city. Stainless steel was invented here a hundred years ago by Harry Brearley and many tens of thousands of people worked in its steel industry and its height. Its steel, its steel and metal trades range from small workshops specialising in cutlery and crafted pieces to huge factories run by household names such as Vickers and British Steel 
who provided steel around the world, including for the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. And the Made in Sheffield brand is a world-renowned mark of quality. Sheffield's industrial heritage is something the city is rightly proud of. And this is a piece of public art that shows Harry Braley, who invented stainless steel. And this is in our cultural industries quarter. And I'll come back to the critical link between industrial heritage and the creative industries in my presentation. But there are also some negatives. Decline of the steel industry was well documented and enshrined in social history, such as in the Full Monty. And the legacy of centuries of heavy industry was writ large in the city's landscapes. And that led to a negative external perception of the city. So our industrial heritage in one sense can also be seen as a problem, but I'll come back to the positives in a minute. And this is a quote from Philip Booth, a town planner from the University of Sheffield, very active in conservation in the city for many years. But that's the external perception that Sheffield had. He then went on to articulate the remarkable renaissance that's taken place in the last 20 years in Sheffield and a very powerful summary of how heritage has been a key part of that regeneration. But we can understand why this perception is there. Dirty factories, smoke and polluted skies. The traditional image of Sheffield was of a polluted northern city dominated by heavy industry, in but in huge but utilitarian factories. Many of these were cleared during the decline in the 70s, but the image of Sheffield as a dirty, polluted industrial city remained in many people's minds, particularly external people. And again, that's the legacy that we had from industry, polluted rivers and smog. But that's been long since cleared that's an example of how the River Don now is a leisure and recreation river. That's the Five Weirs Walk. And we have Riverside Living. The Don and the Sheaf are real assets to the city based and ground in their industrial past, but we're now reimagining them for a, a different generation. We do need to modernise our city image because of all the things I've just said previously, but we shouldn't lose sight of our heritage. And I believe this is entirely possible and that our industrial heritage can play a unique role in making Sheffield a great place to live and work and to redefine its city identity. That's just an example of some of the regenerated riversides. And that's the new image of Sheffield. But Sheffield draws heavily on its industrial past in defining this new image. So anyone who's been into Sheffield Station will have seen the blade. Public, world-class public realm, but using materials associated with its industrial past, water and steel. The polished stainless steel sculptures and water features outside the Winter Gardens, a centrepiece of our Heart of the City regeneration project. So where does our industrial heritage sit in all of this? Well, it's key to the city's local distinctiveness. We celebrate it in our award-winning public realm and it provides unique opportunities to reuse former industrial buildings. And that's an example of how we draw on our industrial heritage in our public realm schemes. So what is Sheffield's industrial heritage and how are we ensuring it's, made, it's making a vital role in the city's regeneration? How can we use it to shape a confident successful and distinctive city in coming decades. Well, Sheffield sits apart. It doesn't have the grand buildings that Manchester and Liverpool has, like the Albert Dock and the fantastic textile and woolen mills. It doesn't have the substantial warehouse projects that have been signature regeneration um, schemes delivered over the last 20 years. A key part of Sheffield's industrial heritage was the large, heavy industrial complexes, which you can see if you drive along the M1, uh, Tinsley Viaduct, and look down the Don Valley um, Valley. 
Many were cleared in the 1980s and 1990s, but we still have an active steel industry within the city, and that's really important, and that's an important part of the city's pride and heritage. And we try and celebrate that. So this is a new biomass power plant built by E.ON, just in the Lower Don Valley. And when they were designing it, we encouraged them to design it in an overtly industrial way, although with a little twist, because it becomes like a beacon of a night when it's lit up. So celebrating that industrial past. But big sheds are one element of the city's metal trade story. The backbone of the metal trades industry was formed from individual skilled craftsmen, the little mesters, who produced cutlery blades, tools and instruments in relatively modest workshops across the city. And they're still doing this to this day, providing high quality products for places like John Lewis. You go in, you get your cutlery, there's a good chance it was made in Sheffield. So this is Sheffield's predominant industrial heritage. Traditional workshops occupied by little mesters, modest in scale, domestic in appearance, shallow in plan to allow the light in, and sometimes poorly built as well. But we have huge swathes of this across the townscape in the city centre and on the edge of the city centre. And what I'll do in a minute is take a few examples of how Sheffield over the last 20 years has tried to drive the regeneration of these former buildings. But before I do that, I just want to reflect on why heritage is important. And that's the link that other people have talked about today, the link between heritage, place quality, and economic competitiveness. And in cities across the world, leaders have recognised the unique role that heritage can play in creating distinctive and attractive places. And that's critical to retaining the talent we need in our cities going forward. That's an image from Illuminating York. And cities worldwide all have the same challenge. How can we use our heritage, reuse it and repurpose it to project a positive image for that city going forward? So that is used very much by City York Council as part of their economic development strategy to say York isn't just kept in aspect, it's a modern dynamic city projecting an image of the, for the type of people who want to live within the city, a key part of its economic agenda. There's a recent study done by KPMG called Magnet Cities, and I'd encourage anyone to have a look at it. Um, what they did is they looked at a whole range of cities across the world that had fallen on tough times and what they did to reimagine and redefine themselves. And they looked at cities such as Bilbao, Tel Aviv, uh, Oklahoma. There's some very positive messages in that report on the role of place quality, heritage and positive conservation in redefining or changing city identity and making cities attractive to what they call are the young wealth creators, the people who are starting up the new businesses, the enterprises, the people who are going to be critical to the success of our cities going forward. So if we can join the physical asset with the people asset and join them together in our historic buildings, that's a fantastic opportunity. And this really sort of articulates why it's important that we focus on people and not just buildings. And in very crude terms, what they were saying in the report is that the early cities were built on trade, so it was about location and access to routes. Then cities came in based on industry, and it was very much you locate them because of the raw materials. But in more recent times, in this century onwards, it's about basing cities on people, and it's about the wealth and the talents of people the human resource talent, and what can cities do to retain that talent. Very quickly, I'll look at um, Pittsburgh, which is one of the magnet cities, very similar to Sheffield, based on steel. And what they had is a terminal decline as steel was pulled out. And what the city tried to do is redefine itself through its educational sector, through a focus on place quality, but what it also did is had a strong focus on the reuse of historic buildings in moving that identity forward. They put a lot of emphasis in, cre in creating a new cultural district. 
There were 10 blocks of old warehouses and mercantile buildings at the, at the heart of the downtown, falling into disrepair. They set out the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, and they created a new unified cultural quarter. And what they've seen is a complete turnaround and people coming into the city. We all know about the High Line in New York and how that's been used to reimagine the role of places. But what can Sheffield do to actually um, develop its heritage and make it a more attractive city going forward? So two very quick case studies. Sheffield Cultural Industries Quarter. Um, the Magnet Cities report was very clear on the role of creative industries to regeneration. And Sheffield recognised this very early on. So when the steel industry collapsed, we sought to broaden our economic base. We created the Cultural Industries Quarter in a deliberate attempt to actually redefine the economy of Sheffield and broaden it. And it's created a positive legacy of new businesses, distinctive places and spaces. So that's a slide showing where it is. It's in the heart of the city centre. It's a very big area. What you have is a real mix of buildings in that area. Um, significant regeneration, a mix of old and new, some distinctive new reuses for those buildings. And it's now the home to over 300 businesses across a range of sectors, including filmmaking, music production, software design, increasingly around the IT agenda, not just the traditional what you would call creative industries. And just some examples, again, of the old and the new. The one at the top right-hand corner, 192 Shoreham Street, I really like that, because that's an unashamedly bold way of taking an old building, adding a new addition, won a Civic Trust Architectural Award. We've got world-leading software designers in that building, historic building brought into a new use. Butcher's Works, which, if you go back into the early 90s, was a building that had fallen into massive disrepair. Uh, really serious decline. What happened with that is we restored it in 2006 through a Townscape Heritage Initiative. 1.3 million grants matched by 6 million from the private sector. Next door, there's a building called Sterling Works, which is now a new use for Ruskin College. So this was about partnership working to bring old industrial buildings back into new uses. I won't dwell on Sellers Wheel because we've got a presentation later from Peter um, Cartwright on that, but that's a fantastic regeneration of an old industrial building. University Technical College, one of the new generation of, this is about creating the skills for, for people to, to move forward in the economy. Council owned the site. There was three unlisted buildings on that site, all of heritage value but unlisted. Through a positive regeneration brief we managed to persuade the college to actually um, keep that and use it in the redesign of the building so that's an interior shot of it now what I really like about this one is the mix of the creative and the industrious the old and the new bringing them together to bring new buildings back to life and the final example I'll just very quickly flick over is Kellam Island this sits in the heart of the city centre, one of the earliest centres of industry within Sheffield. And in 1985, it was one of the earliest industrial conservation areas declared in the country. It's a real mix of uh, old and new buildings within the area, but real vibrancy and a real distinctive feel because of that. Home to the Kellam Island Museum, the Chimney House to the, rear is a to the rear is a really good example of an industrial reuse. Um, for creative industries and new business space. And finally, uh, Little Kellam. I couldn't talk about um, the regeneration of Kellam Island without talking about the Little Kellam scheme. Fantastic partnership with Situ, a Leeds-based developer. They brought innovation to the site, but they've also been very, very mindful of what the heritage of that uh, area and the buildings are. And at the heart of that, you can see restoration of a of an old industrial building, but adds real distinctiveness to the regeneration of that area and that site. I'll wrap up now. I was going to talk to you about the, our um, 
stuck sites program, but I think I can pick that up in the discussion session because I know one of the key things everyone's thinking about is how do we fund regeneration in these really difficult times. And what we're starting to do is draw in new homes bonus money to use that to unlock, how, to unlock sites to bring more housing into the city. So that's an example of how you need to be more innovative to bring things forward. That's probably where I'll end, so hopefully that gives you plenty of food for thought. My concluding views would be we need to be aware of what our legacy, industrial legacy is. There is some negative aspects to that, but when we look at cities going forward and what their roles will be, and the real importance of the young wealth creators. It's critical that we use our industrial heritage to drive that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you David. Thank you very much indeed. I thought I knew sort of some of the sites around Sheffield, but I have to say that you've shown us a range of sites that I wasn't familiar with at all. So. Uh, uh, it really brings home to you the sort of vast wealth of opportunity and challenge, if I can put it that way, that many of our uh, sort of industrial and post-industrial cities face uh, with the number of fabulous buildings that they need to find opportunities and